Okay, so um, I suppose the the reason we're we're a double act was that um, we we suddenly uh, got to realise the the scale of the difficulty with a shortage of Eliza's buffer, and this happened uh, quite quite far back in in March uh, of this year. And you see here that we're presenting as well on behalf of our other team members, and those are Catherine Dempsey, who's a senior medical scientist in CUH in microbiology, Dr. John McSharry uh, in microbiology in UCC and in the APC, um, Isabel O'Callaghan, who's a senior medical scientist again in microbiology in CUH, there's Dr. Paul O'Connor in Togusk in uh, Pramoy, uh, Dr. John O'Callaghan in microbiology UCC. Dr. Connor Horgan in Eli Lilly and Dondero Kinsale, Dr. Edel Jurak in the University of Limerick, Dr. Paul Cotter, who's also in Togus in Pramoy, uh, Dr. Sarah Hudson in the University of Limerick, uh, a chemist in the University of Limerick, Dr. Humphrey Moynihan um, again in Lilly in Dondero Kinsale, and Dr. Nicola Fletcher in UCD. So we've rather um, a large group of people got together in a great hurry. And I suppose we move on to the next slide. I'm not sure if I can move it down. Okay. So this has been a bit of a roller coaster. I think James referred to it. Uh, the first case was officially notified to the World Health Organization in China on the 31st of December 2019. And Really, it, it, by the 13th of January 2020, it, it had spread, COVID-19 had spread outside of China to Thailand. Um, by the 6th of June, just to give you a snapshot, there were 6.7 million cases notified to the World Health Organization, and there were some 400,000 deaths at that stage. Um, I just had a, a very quick look, and just again, a snapshot uh, as of um, yesterday. And the BBC News is reporting that there are 38 and a half million cases at this stage, of which there's over a million deaths. So you can see that the, the new cases are going up very quickly and the deaths are rising. They're starting to rise again in the northern um, hemisphere as well, um, I suppose, in line with the season of the year that tends to um, start the, uh, I suppose, things like, we we'll say, um, influenza. Um, and now this pandemic, we expect to, to rise again in this, in this part of the year, uh, and we're seeing a rise. So I suppose next slide again. And essentially, just to give you um, an, a very uh, fast overview, just to remind you really, I'm probably um, backtracking a bit on, uh, on what James has already given to you. Um, but essentially a nasopharyngeal swab, um, ideally, I suppose, uh, usually is taken on a patient suspected of, of having COVID-19 disease. The sample is sent to the lab. The scientists will check the specimen against the patient name in the request form, and then they prepare to test. You can see that you, use, you need containment facilities. You also need to have a means to crack open the viral particles, uh, and Eliza's buffer is generally used for that. Then we set uh, in, in our hospital laboratories, for example, um, we'll set up our reaction wells with our extracted uh, samples um, so that quantitative real-time PCR will happen such as James has already described. You can see the, the same sigmoidal curve there in, uh, in, in the test screen where it says test samples positive and negative controls all included. Um, and then if the virus is present in the sample, as you know, part of its nucleic acid sequence is amplified to give a positive set test signal and a flat line will denote a negative. Again, um, you need to have internal controls uh, for each sample to make sure that each individual test was not inhibited by something that was in the original sample. You also have separate positive and negative controls. Ultimately, where you've got a valid run, a patient report is issued to say whether the virus was detected or not detected. So, I suppose we'll go into, so that's the process. And in our case, um, because Ireland is a small country, I suppose we had um, uh, a, a certain um, advantage. But we, sorry, that's the, the next slide. Yeah. Okay, the problem. So in March, there was an international shortage of Liza's buffer. And what actually caused some of the problem was something as simple 
uh, apparently, as Donald Trump standing on the grass in front of the White House, say, um, you know, praising a huge, big uh, multinational pharmaceutical company that produces an awful lot of reagents and reagent kits and saying that they would support the American people. And what happened straight after that was that there was a shortage um, in much of the rest of the world, uh, given that this is a major market, um, you know, shareholder. And they and other companies started having to supply to, we'd say, the United States, which were a huge uh, draw on resources. And there was no, then there was no, I suppose, guarantee that regular old customers like ourselves would automatically be supplied with enough of the uh, reagents that we needed. Um, as I said uh, already, that we need Liza's buffer for proper extraction of virus from patient samples. There was a second possibility, I suppose, when you were extracting, and that's that if you didn't, you know, kill off or render non-infectious the viral particles in the patient sample, it's quite possible that when you go to, we'll say, you know, to, to vortex your, your sample when mixing it, for example, that it would be quite possible that you would cause an outbreak in your own laboratory. So we were very, I suppose, concerned as, as a group of scientists that, uh, that whatever happened and whatever way we used to extract the virus from a sample, that we didn't cause outbreaks within our own very, um, I, I suppose, very limited numbers of scientists who were actually already working flat out. So James was talking about uh, the, the situation where you have to you know, black swan and white swan groups who don't meet each other and who who if if one of those goes goes down with with an outbreak that the other will continue. We were particularly anxious that our whatever method was used to extract the virus would protect the scientists as well as as um, giving rise hopefully to to um, true positive results and not false negatives in other words. So um, the threat was that. At that point, without sufficient buffer, um, testing would slow down or stop. So it wasn't enough to say, OK, we we'll try this buffer, we we'll try that buffer, should we just uh, mix it all together and, ho and hope for the best, use that for, for testing afterwards, preparing our samples for testing. Because you could easily get false negatives as well. I suppose we we'll move on. Um, so as I was saying, Ireland is a very small country and we have links between one another were very uh, closely associated with each other a lot of the time we just have to I suppose uh, pick up a phone or uh, email one another or text one another and it just so happened that um, through the uh, Academy of Clinical Science and Laboratory Medicine uh, the all of the laboratories pretty much in the country at that stage all the hospital uh, microbiology laboratories uh, had a WhatsApp group um, so that they were able to keep in touch with one another on a daily basis. And also researchers and lecturers in different third level institutions uh, find it very easy to contact one another. Very often they're collaborating or they know one another well, um, as Martina and myself would, uh, for example. So it's, it's only a matter of picking up from the last conversation, even if you didn't speak for a year, you, you know, I suppose, you know, that old friendships uh, re remain, you know. Um, I, at the time, was president of the of this professional body, the ACSLM uh, for Medical Scientists in Ireland, and that was useful because I was able to see what the problems were, and Liza's buffer was the biggest problem that people were facing. So people, somebody in Letter Kenny was saying, I am in dire need of getting Liza's buffer, and somebody in Dublin say, well, we, we might be able to give you some, but there's nothing coming in, so we're, we're going to be stuck by tomorrow, or we've got 200, we can do 200 more tests. Um, and people were actually driving, there were people driving from, say, Letterkenny down to Sligo or down to Galway um, with smallish amounts of buffer in order to try to keep sister laboratories on, on, the, on the go at that time. Um, so industry also heard about the problem from CUH via CIT because um, an ex-colleague of mine, who's now the laboratory manager at CUH, rang me looking for advice on who might have reagents. They were starting to think at this stage, this is dire. We're used to buying in reagents and now suddenly the supply has stopped. I suppose you, could, you might well ask if you don't work in a hospital laboratory, why would you not make up your reagents all the time by yourself rather than depending on commercial companies? Some of it is the fact that the 
I suppose the the quality control of the operation that you're running uh, is is has very high standards. And if you are going to be making up your own reagents, uh, you know they're going to need very stringent uh, quality control. If you're buying them in, the quality control you can you can observe that quality control of those products is very stringent and it makes uh, you know i suppose the the validation or verification of of any uh, commercial reagent easier than if you're going to make it up yourself second thing i'd say about that is that if you're going to be making up a lot of reagents it's going to be actually very costly in terms of man hours and most of the um, i suppose the cost of running a hospital laboratory is actually the staff so even though you're buying in reagents uh, and they're expensive, in some ways they can be much less expensive than if you had to get your own scientists to make them up as well as do all of the testing. So that, that's a kind of a background as to why you wouldn't have um, people making up a lot of reagents. We used to make up an awful lot of reagents before, but uh, it's become lesser. But the difficulty then is that if the supply stops suddenly, you have to, to be able to be resourceful, I suppose. Um, Eli Lilly, as it turned out, became a contact for CUH because we, we suddenly um, thought Eli Lilly, for, for certain reasons, would, might be a source of some of the constituents of, of a likely lysis buffer. Do you want to try the next slide, I'd say, Martina? Um, so as it turned out, we were now in a, a huge hurry. Uh, we needed to create a lysis buffer, we needed to validate it for use, and we needed to make enough of it to be useful. One of the things is that where you validate it, it was very useful that we still had small amounts uh, of the uh, commercial lysis buffer, and we knew how that performed in people's hands in laboratories. So we were able to go, we had the capability to compare any new lysis buffer that we made up against the performance of the commercial uh, version of it, if you like. Um, a lot of those uh, lysis buffer formulations are proprietary to the companies that produce them, as I think James might have mentioned. So um, it was actually definitely back to the drawing board and it needed some, uh, some virologists with, with very good past experience. Um, Martina Scallon and John McSharry in UCC um, started formulating their buffers. Um, Paul O'Connor and Paul Cotter in Togus in Formoy were doing the same. And also a third centre in, in the University of Limerick um, in the chemistry department, Sarah and Edel were also um, working on supplying the um, Limerick University Hospital with buffer, but they also provided a risk assessment for our process. Some of the constituents were not that beautiful to be working with um, or to be using, so uh, a risk assessment was necessary um, not to um, I suppose to, to risk the health of anybody who was working without the constituents or the finished buffer product. Okay, Martina, do you want to go on to the next one? So this is where I probably will hand over to Martina to take up some of the story. We were in rapid email contact with one another, I think at one stage, I think a Sunday was when, when the penny dropped for us, uh, wasn't it? As far as I remember in March. So I'll hand well, I kind of remember it pivoting around St. Patrick's weekend. Mm. And my memory mm. kind of links in again with what James was saying about in early March, there were a lot of emails coming out from the hospitals, and I think this was happening all over Ireland, to the local higher education institutions asking for reagents or plasticware because the demand was becoming so much higher than it would have been up until that point. And in amongst those requests was one for lysis buffer. And I responded back to the consultant that had sent the email saying, well, you know, I could actually make the lysis buffer. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about <laughs> my own history a little bit later. But it was, wasn't until Bridget and I made firm contact and communication on this that I was confident that if we went ahead and tried to develop a lysis buffer that it could be validated in a hospital laboratory setting and therefore would be used. So it really was um, the, the, I think, good fortune of myself and Bridget being able to communicate clearly that then kind of released all of the potential that was actually working away maybe in isolated little pockets around Ireland. And the urgency of the situation 
caused that all to coalesce into a really effective effort over the next 10 days. So, um, so I would say from those early emails, um, it was just after, because we all had to get permission, we, lockdown had happened as well. We had to get special letters issued to allow us to get into the university to use our labs. So myself and John McSherry in UCC were working together. There was Paul Cotter and Paula in Tagusk. And there were people in Limerick and in Sligo. Because I remember John and myself would be in here actually making up. We made a, a small batch initially of three different formulations. And then we came back in and made a big batch of the one that turned out to be successful, which was the four molar guanidinium isothiocyanate based lysis buffer. But just there was one weekend I will never forget and my family will never forget because I didn't leave the computer because there wasn't only the practical efforts that John McSherry and myself were working on here. I was also advising over email people in Tagusk, people in Sligo, people in Limerick. Um, and it was, what would I say? I was delighted to be able to bring to bear experience that I had gained something like 25 years previously in my days as a PhD student when we didn't have kids, we had to make up our own reagents. And I look back and sometimes some of the things I was dealing with were very toxic. So while we have the infectious threat with SARS-CoV-2, the guanidinium isothiocyanate itself is a toxic chemical. So as Bridget alluded to, handling it safely is important too. So it is too much to expect a hospital lab to be making up these chemicals as well as dealing with the infectious hazard. But at the same time, it allows me to say it is very important to understand the fundamentals. So for research scientists and for scientists training through their undergraduate and postgraduate years, it is very important to understand the fundamentals so that you can draw on that knowledge to make a difference should it be required. Um, so through Bridget and the lab in CUH, where it was um, Catherine Dempsey, I think that led together with Isabel O'Callaghan, the tests against what was left of the existing Roche um, lysis buffer. We managed to test the different formulations that um, each, well, it was actually the ones that were sent at, tested at CUH were just the ones made at, C, at UCC and in Tagus. I think that's right, Bridget. Mm, I think so, yeah. Um, this, as I said, all happened within 10 days, um, even to the point of once we had seen um, how good the four molar lysis buffer was, we felt um, there was an urgency to get that information out and available as widely as possible because the difficulty was, it wasn't only the made up lysis buffer that was scarce. The key ingredient, the guanidinium isothiocyanate was in really was scarce to find anywhere in the world. So obviously the production sites where this would normally be prepared were affected by lockdown. Um, so one of the guiding principles, I suppose, for John and myself when we were in the lab was to, you know, find the minimum amount of GITC that had to be used for an effective lysis buffer. And both John and I knew from past experience that four molar guanidinium isothiocyanate um, was pretty good when you're doing extractions of RNA from RNA virus preparations. Now, 
my familiarity with RNA extraction, as I said, goes back to my days as a PhD student. And this was at the end of the 80s when I started, the 1980s when I started my PhD. And around that time, uh, a, a kind of key paper came out by Kaminsky and Sachi that introduced this guanidinium isothiocyanate um, method for extracting RNA. And so that's, my training was very much based on that and I focused on four molar. But from talking to Bridget, I learned that the extraction methods in the hospital labs, um, you know, were much more sophisticated than what I would have been using back then. And there's the use of glass beads that have a magnetism to them for extracting the RNA. So in the intensity of those days, you know, I'm staying up late on the computer, not only with emails, but doing searches, trying to find out more about the, the procedures that we used in the hospital lab that I wouldn't have been so up on. And I learned um, then that there was a paper that showed that two molar guanidinium isothiocyanate was optimal with glass beads. Now, remember when you're doing the lysis, you have to mix the lysis buffer with the sample and it's a one-to-one -one mix. So you would be diluting the four molar down to two. So before we started, my hope, I think was um, that this would be true, that two molar would be great with glass beads. Um, so anyway, we, we went on to make a whole range of lysis buffers to test. Um, within the 10 days, we got out a preprint. We wrote up um, what we had found with clear instructions on how to make the lysis buffer and that was uploaded to an open access platform so that it was available to everyone um, throughout the world. And I suppose that paper was written in two days in the end because of the forward and back, forward and back, forward and back. And it was the weekend, it was Saturday. It took us all yeah. Saturday and all day Sunday. Uh, a whole lot of us were on board with this thing and weren't we? It was just going around. Um, yeah. And it, quite, it, quite we kept get. going, everyone doing their bit. If it had been down to me alone, I could not have stayed up. As I said, my family were said, Would you get away from the computer? <laughs> but had it been me alone, I wouldn't have kept going. But it was everybody making their contribution. And um, so we got that preprint out anyway. With now we need to get the final paper <laughs> properly um, out. Mm. So just, I'd like to take a step back now and just explain, you know, why guanidinium isothiocyanate is a key ingredient and why we also need a detergent um, to help with the extraction. Um, and let me just, so my PhD was in Glasgow um, in the Institute of Virology in Glasgow. And some 25 years before, um, I turned up for my PhD, June Almeida, um, who happened to be from Glasgow, um, was working away as an electron microscopist. And she was the first person to generate an electron micrographic image of a coronavirus that could infect humans. So this um, image, which I'm sure you've all seen, is an image of a human coronavirus isolate. And this was actually isolated from nasal washings from an English schoolboy in the 1960s during research into the common cold. So um, the name of this isolate, I can't, it was B something I can't see because all these photos are here, B814. Um, and there was a, an archive of, you are all still there, aren't you? Because I've closed my thing down, you are. Um, the, yeah, not seeing you is putting me off here, but never mind. Um, so there, so coronaviruses were known to affect humans back in those days, but just causing symptoms of the common cold. This whole archive though has been lost since because um, 
nobody preserved all the samples that would have been in a freezer um, in the back of a freezer, maybe in somebody's lab. So the, in um, schematic form, a coronavirus particle has um, a reasonably stable structure, but its weak point is that it has a lipid envelope um, through which the surface proteins of the virus project. So if you cut the virus particle open, you have um, what is actually a very long genome for an RNA virus. So coronaviruses are very unusual in that they have a 30 um, kilobase single-stranded RNA genome. Most RNA virus genomes would be only around 10 um, thousand base pairs, not 30. So this then is encased in a lipid envelope that is supported by quite a strong matrix of protein-protein interactions. And the protein that projects furthest is the spike protein of the virus. But there is also this hemagglutinin esterase and what isn't shown in this diagram, but is very important, are multiple copies of a matrix protein as well. And I'll come back to that. The virus particle is described as being metastable. Um, so that is, it's kind of stable when it's outside of a living host to protect the RNA genome. But then it has to be able to, sorry now, it has to be able to open up inside of a living cell to start the replication cycle. So although the first um, archive of human coronaviruses, you know, that was being built up in the 1960s was lost, um, coronaviruses in human populations um, came to our attention again um, since the advent of the year 2000. And it was um, the emergence of SARS-CoV in 2003 that really focused um, our attention on human coronaviruses again. Um, that SARS coronavirus had a 10% fatality rate and infection control measures eventually stopped the circulation of that SARS-CoV. So there's no current circulation of that virus. Now, there are other seasonal coronaviruses that affect humans, um, and they are currently circulating and cause common cold simple symptoms. They were discovered again in the early 2000s. And then the second um, emergent human coronavirus this century was MERS-CoV, um, and that emerged in 2012 with a 30% fatality rate. And it has not yet um, been eliminated. There is still um, occasional outbreaks. Uh, fortunately, we have systems to study these viruses. And you know, one way that we study these viruses is to observe their effects on cells, and they grow well in monolayers of cells derived from monkeys called Vero cells. And here you see uninfected Vero cells, and then this is actually a monolayer of Vero cells, which has been infected with SARS-CoV-2. So with cultures that will support the replication of this virus, research laboratories across the world are able to grow the virus for research purposes, but of course under biosafety level three containment conditions. So not everywhere would have those containment conditions. So I want to come back to talk about virus structure since we're talking about how we pull that apart in the lab for testing. So this just focuses in on that envelope that surrounds the virus. And you can see the spike proteins projecting from the envelope. 
And there are multiple copies of this matrix protein as well that um, extend through the membrane, but also extend down within the virus particle to make contact with the nucleocapsid protein. And the nucleocapsid protein is what surrounds the RNA. It's the first line of protection, if you like, around the RNA. And then the virus assembles these multiple layers of protein that really are like a lattice, quite a stable lattice around the virus particle. But then it's also got the involvement of the lipid bilayer. So the reason alcohol, 70% alcohol, is so effective at inactivating coronavirus is it dissolves the lipid envelope. So this affects the sort of arrangement of the proteins on the surface of the virus particle. And as well, the lipid envelope is essential for the mode of entry of SARS coronavirus into your cells. So it inhibits its infectivity. So any organic solvent that we can tolerate um, is good to inactivate the virus. And here you're just seeing an electron microscopic image of SARS-CoV-2 variants inside infected viral cells. So just a high magnification of what's going on within the cells. So in trying to um, extract the RNA to test, um, to derive a, a test to see if an individual is positive or negative, um, a key ingredient is guanidinium isothiocyanate, which is a chaotropic agent, which basically means it destroys hydrogen bonding. And hydrogen bonding is essential for the proper folding of proteins. And that proper folding of proteins is essential for the stability of the virus particle. Um, guanidinium denatures the proteins and importantly, it suppresses the activity of enzymes called RNases because the main enemy um, against anyone who wants to detect an RNA molecule is avoiding that RNA being destroyed by RNases, which are basically everywhere around us. Um, but guanidinium isothiocyanate is excellent at inhibiting those. So its um, value in a lysis buffer is really twofold, disassembling, helping to disassemble the virus particle but also protecting that virus RNA at the center. Now, the world supply, as I said, had become seriously depleted um, at the time in March when we all started to come together. Um, there's a backstory actually that a PhD student in Dublin as part of this kind of disparate effort across the island managed to secure um, a huge amount of guanidinium isothiocyanate in the middle of all this effort that was shipped into Ireland that will be enough to make lysis buffer for some time to come. Um, another key ingredient, remember I pointed out that lipid envelope, is to destroy that lipid envelope and detergent, just as alcohol is excellent at destroying that lipid envelope, so is soap and so is detergent. So Tritonex 100 um, is a, a, was one immediate um, component that we certainly wanted to include in the lysis buffer. So um, I think I've, I've more or less told you it was the Chaminsky and Saatchi paper um, that was the starting point, but adapted then kind of as I read up about the glass bead extraction method and that two molar should be good for that. We in fact um, tested four molar, uh, a license buffer with four molar GITC and 3% Triton X100. Um, another at 5.4 molar GITC with 3% Triton. And Tagusk made one at 4.75 molar that did not have Triton. 
and um, we also then made up a six molar with 3% triton. And these were tested against the existing Roche buffer and a Keogen RNA lysis buffer. And um, so just to simplify this a little, if we just look at the four molar symbol with 3% triton, um, this was uh, run with a known, with known positive samples and the buffer performed um, well, the CT values were reasonably low for this sample at about, you know, in a range of 21 to 23, really. And we were well within the acceptable range with the advantage that we were using a low amount of the, um, the seriously scarce um, reagent at the time. So we published um, the composition of our buffer. There are also other ingredients. Um, the pH of our buffer was pH 7.6 and it contained FISHCL and EDTA as well. Um, and just for the Roche buffer that had been used in the hospital labs had bromophenol blue in it. And that allowed you to see by a color change that the lysis buffer had been added. So while that has no kind of impact on the actual virus itself in terms of breaking apart the virus, it gives the reassurance to the person who is carrying out the extraction that the lysis buffer has been added and will be inactivating the infectivity. As Bridget was saying, it's key to keep a safe environment in the testing labs. So anything you can do to give reassurance is good. So that's why that is there. Um, but beyond the satisfaction of um, coming up with a lysis buffer that could supply um, the demand, the nature of the collaboration was incredibly um, positive. It was people working together for something beyond themselves that really could have an impact, not only locally, nationally, but also globally. And you'll see soon that the, um, pay, the preprint has been downloaded all over the world and is one of the highest um, downloaded paper um, in the intervening period. Um, now, further collaboration with Dr. Nicola Fletcher, a virologist at UCD, who has access to a biosafety level three laboratory, has allowed assays to be done to actually have the data to show that the lysis buffer does inactivate SARS-CoV-2. I'll show you that in a minute. But the message um, for me here was, you know, do ask for help because there are people standing ready um, to work together at any one point. So yeah, this is the latest data on the downloads of the preprint. So 320 downloads to date um, from all corners of the world. So, and we, I have had emails immediately from India, Australia, and um, people asking um, about, uh, for, for advice about extracting RNA and testing labs all over the world. So thanks to Nicola Fletcher, who performed assays called um, tissue culture infectious dose 50 assays, which basically when I showed you that um, the effect of SARS-CoV-2 on Vero cells. When the virus gets onto the Vero cells, within 24 hours, you'll see that rounding up effect, which is called cytopathic effect. Um, and you, the TCID50 assay basically means, um, sorry, um, plating out replicates of tenfold serial dilutions of your virus sample. So here, um, these were control samples, four replicates diluted 
um, down to 10 to the minus 13. And you're looking for the point at which you lose cytopathic effect um, to give you an indication of how much infectivity is in your sample. And for the control SARS-CoV-2, um, there was at least 10 to the 7 platforming units per mil of the virus in the sample and um, because we were seeing CPE at 10 to the minus 7 dilution in most of the replicates. Um, now for the lysis buffer test, the, the virus of the lysis buffer were mixed um, one to one and then serial dilutions were made again. Now, clearly, something like guanidinium isothiocyanate and, sorry, I don't, and detergent are going to damage cells as well. So um, it turned out there was damage to the cell monolayer at the minus, 10 to the minus two and 10 to the minus three dilutions. So we can't actually tell what's going on here because the monolayer is damaged anyway by the lysis buffer. Um, but certainly the infectivity of um, the SARS-CoV-2 was, oh, sorry, I don't know why, was significantly reduced by, um, by our lysis buffer. Now this was tested against other lysis buffers, um, including the commercial ones, and exactly the same was seen. So it's certainly as good as um, the commercial ones. And thank you to Nicola for this data. So um, I really do a heartfelt thanks to everybody who worked on this. It, it has been one of the most satisfying um, endeavors of my career, um, partly because of the, the generosity in the spirit of everyone working together. Um, and it's been a joy to work with Bridget and my own colleagues here, um, John O'Callaghan, who helped us gather reagents from around the School of Microbiology and everybody who provided those reagents um, from their lab. So many people fed into this. And of course, um, the lysis buffer then was initially made up to four and a half litres to supply um, different hospital labs across the country by our local um, Eli Lilly down in Dunduro. And since then, um, NIBERT, the National Institute for Biotechnology Training, um, have taken up um, the task of making batches as they're required. But of course, each batch is going to have to be validated um, to make sure it's performing, providing consistent testing in the hospital labs where it's being used. Um, and it's great to have um, started working with Nicola Fletcher as well up in UCD. So thank you, everybody. I hope you're still there. It's disconcerting not seeing you. <laughs> I think there's Good, 43, you Martina. There's 43 of us. <laughs> right. All I can see. Okay. So, uh, yeah. yeah. So well, actually, uh, I have to say what a pleasure <laughs> it's been working with you, Martina. You know, it's just been... You. It's been a joy. Well, no, it genuinely has now. It, it, it was. It's been a great experience. And um, we're still, we'll keep going, still going. We're teaching as well now, of course. Yeah. So. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so the Q&A session is now open in the chat. And I just wanted to thank both of you because I you know you're very busy with lectures. You do lecture um, my class anyway. So thank you so much for taking the time to um, to be here with I'm trying to get my pictures back so I can see you all. <laughs> yes. Okay, I'm better now. Um, would you like me to read the questions or are you happy um, to? I actually read can't them? see them at the moment. I will. I've just got my pictures back. Now I want to find. Would you mind reading them for now? Because I'm just not seeing them for some no reason. Problem. Okay. 
I'll try my um, very best. So guanidine thiocyanide is quite a nasty chemical as there are some other chemicals used to liberate the RNA. Are there any physical methods that you could think that could be useful to disrupt the envelope in lieu of chemical treatment? No, I lost your sound for a while. Okay, um, I can repeat it. So it's just that the guanidine thiocyanide is a very nasty chemical. So do you, could you think of any other um, method that could be used to disrupt the envelope in lieu of that? Um, so for, for actually extracting the RNA, is it? Yeah. What you need to be able to do is protect the RNA as well. And this is where the guanidinium is excellent. And it has to be something that's reasonably high throughput in the hospital setting. There are filter methods, um, you know, you can lyse viruses with, you could put an EDTA and um, detergent in there. But um, I don't know the efficiency with guanidinium and the fact that the testing methods in the hospital labs kind of are used to using lysis buffers that have guanidinium in them, um, I think means we're a little bit far away from using something else at the moment. James oh, might. Yeah. Some people are using heat as well, that, but then there was the, oh, yeah. do you remember that some people are using heating blocks, but the, we were worried that the virus wouldn't be completely inactivated. I think that was one of our, that was one of our concerns really, wasn't it, at the time? You can destroy the infectivity with heat, but again, it's preserving the RNA. Mm you know, for the test. It's like when James was saying that some of his, you know, the CT values were down kind of around 30. You know, you don't have much, you don't want, you want to get back as much RNA as you can um, in the extraction. I yeah. suppose the other thing is that if you don't have um, a very efficient, um, safe, uh, well, say, I suppose it's, it's safer to know the chemical hazards of guanidium as a thiocyanate than worrying about um, contracting SARS-CoV-2. Uh, I suppose it's, it's, um, it's the lesser of two evils in some ways. But I suppose the second thing is that if you, if you don't have a method that's very standardized, then you don't know if you're getting false, if you're giving out false negative results. Great, I feel that, that definitely I suppose, yeah. answers that question. It kind of went over my head a little bit, but anyway. Um, so the next question is, the person asking the question knows that a six molar of urea is a catatrophic agent as it denatures protein. So do you think that could be a substitute for the guanidium um, at any stage? Um, it could be tested. You know, I think that's the, I don't know is the answer but i suppose uh, you'd always be afraid that it's going to inhibit your pcr as well wouldn't you you know um or inhibit it to some extent like the, the more variables like that you put in the more worry you have that it's going to possibly that it's going to affect the quality of the results you give out i mean so i think that kind of thing could be tested kind of from mm. a fundamental mm. point of view you know you could look at rna's rna yields mm. um but then it might be a while before that could be transferred into a hospital lab setting, you know, where things are set up for a particular um, set of equipment or process. Mm. Um, but thank you, nice idea. Yeah, um, but it is, it's, as you said, Bridget, it's not only protecting the RNA, so it's not only liberating the RNA, then protecting it but also making sure you're not carrying over anything that would inhibit the RT-PCR. Perfect, so just the next question, is the buffer being used in all labs across the country at the moment? So I believe the buffer you described. Yeah, no, no, no. Not to our knowledge. Um... And, and different, you know, it has been tested on certain systems um, because even James now in his talk, I'm not sure is our, uh, buffer compatible with his system? Well, do you know, it's funny, actually, we, we ran out of license buffer at one stage and um, Catherine Dempsey gave us a bottle of year buffer. So we <laughs> validated and we've used it as well. So it got us out of a hole too. So um, yeah. I know yeah. others have used it too. So yeah. 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 So yeah, no, it was, it was used around the country because there were a lot of labs looking for it. And then there were, there were labs that were keeping it in reserve as well. So um, I think one of the good things was that Nybert um, had the ability to make large amounts of it. And in fact, they did make a good bit um, 
to, to, to keep in reserve as well, so that we wouldn't have this mad scrambling panic that we had back in March again. Um, not because of, you know, like we couldn't even prepare the samples that had all uh, test them. Yeah, and then there's, as I said, there was that um, detective work done by a PhD student in Dublin. I, I don't know if he was in chemistry, I think, where he sourced this large vat that then had to get in through customs in Dublin. Yeah. James, you were talking about the problem with you getting a small amount of lysis buffer, was it? You were yeah. trying to get in and get held in customs. You can imagine this big vat of a dangerous chemical coming in. So well, they had to de-lump it or something, didn't they? They yeah. had to de-lump it. I mean, this, it's incredible it's to find out about the expertise we have in Ireland. It's yeah. incredible, I think. And the willingness of people to work together, I, it's just, it's been um, an eye-opener. It has, hasn't it? And I suppose it's, you know, the idea that like we've taken increasing globalisation so much for granted and that, you know, people thinking it's okay to buy your beans from Ghana or your, you know, your, your real time PCR assay from Korea <laughs> or whatever, sorry, Korea or whatever, it's all very fine, except that unless you have a backup plan for if they stop supplying that, you know, that, that there is some way of, of actually setting up your own assay. Like traditionally, I suppose one of the great things is that we depend, we depend upon the National Virus Reference Laboratory to have in-house tests, which means that they set up their own assays. Um, and that's that's a great thing because, you know, I suppose they they have the ability to, to get through an awful lot of tests and they also make up make their own assays. Now you still have to get reagents for them, but at least they, they're there as a kind of a repository, aren't they, James? I mean, the, they, they're there as well. Um, but I suppose if you can't even prepare your samples uh, with something as simple sounding as a lysis buffer, I mean, it's not that simple, but, you know, something where at least if you had that, in some cases, people, people only need 200 microliters of that or 150 microliters, depending on which type of assay they were running afterwards. And that's all they needed for a test. But if they didn't have it, they couldn't run the test, you know. So I suppose it was kind of an interesting eye opener, really. Definitely. I'll just hop on to the next question. There's only two more, so this is the second last one. Um, in terms of virus evolution, how complex is SARS-CoV-2? That's one That's for Martina anyway. A nice question. There. <laughs> <laughs> um, in terms of virus evolution, how complex? Yeah, I mean, do you know, it used to be that there weren't that many virologists working on coronaviruses because the biology of coronaviruses is more complex than... Um, many other viruses for a start they have this 30,000 base pair single-stranded RNA genome which is really long because an RNA is a relatively unstable molecule you know we're all anyone working with RNA is kind of scared of RNAs and they're so abundant so for a virus to have such a long genome is unusual and they also have a very unusual mode of gene expression um, so the virus itself is relatively complex to understand. And um, since the SARS-CoV outbreak in 2003, there's been much more intensive research on human coronaviruses. Now there are coronaviruses affecting animals. I mean, there's a huge family of coronaviruses. James, you showed um, something about the classification in your talk. Um, and there is, when you have a long RNA molecule, you have the opportunity for recombination events. Um, if you get kind of dual infection, um, RNA viruses tend to evolve more rapidly because RNA polymerases generally in viruses don't have a proofreading ability. But I'm hearing things about um, SARS-CoV-2 that maybe that doesn't mutate as fast as some other RNA viruses. So. Um, does that go some way to answering your question, Thomas? I suppose you, you're not talking. So th th they're very interesting viruses. And if you're a biomedical four, <laughs> biomedical science fourth year, you might hear a bit more about that in virology this year. I look forward to that anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so just the last question, um, it might be for James, I would say, how are viruses like COVID-19 maintained in the laboratory for analysis? Um, so I suppose it starts really with the, the collection into an appropriate medium. So um, 
there, there's this was another thing that ran short was um, Universal Transport Media and uh, Fire Transport Media, and um, I know that some brothers were looking at uh, keeping the RNA stable in saline and um, even just the raw swab and using that directly for for analysis. Um, so we've seen that um, media such as your viral transfer media um, is probably the, the safest thing, as Martina was talking about your RNAs, uh, you know, that's going to help, um, uh, you know, eliminate them and uh, maintain the stability of the RNA for analysis. Um, and uh, if we, 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 we refrigerate the samples before analysis, and uh, if there is a, a subsequent delay, then that we freeze them to ensure um, just freeze it once really uh, freeze thaws very bad for your RNA as well um, so I suppose between a combination of a couple of things so uh, the transport media uh, the storage conditions being uh, refrigeration uh, or freezing if it's if it's extended and um, I, I think that's that's it I hope that answers it Great, and we've just had one more question pop in the meantime. So have commercial companies scaled up the production of buffer in order to meet the growing demand for testing, or will there be a need for the labs to produce batches of buffers such as yours going into the future? I can answer a little bit about that because I know that there's been uh, the same the, the same types of worry about shortages have happened in the last couple of weeks. Um, and I think that people have been kind of bailed out uh, I'm just looking at the WhatsApp group, actually, um, which is on my phone, uh, which gives you an, a, me an updated uh, version of, of what's happening with um, with reagents and so on. And, and one of the same companies, uh, big suppliers, again, has um, has been very slow to deliver some of some of that reagent in the past while. So um, I, there, there could well be there could be the difficulty as well i suppose is if you're using the same reagents some of the same reagents for different types of assays um that other assays could be left short because it's in the same extraction methods or whatever so it may there may well be a shortage again um but it might well be for other non-prioritized assays so it depends, you know, so it's funny, it may spread to other, the problem may spread to other assays that are done other than that for, for SARS-CoV-2 detection. Um, so uh, we don't know, but, but you know, there, there, there is constant, I suppose, concern um, because ramping up, as you can see, testing, testing is going up, up, up at the moment. And I suppose the one thing is, people are looking at other means of testing as well, apart from yeah. RT-PCR, but Absolutely. we're still waiting for those yeah. on the street. I suppose testing antibodies after you've got positive <clears throat> PCRs is, is actually um, kind of more useful really, isn't it, Martina? Like you don't know whether somebody is still um, suffering from the disease just because they <laughs> to be um, sort of um, RT-PCR positive for, for SARS-CoV. Um, so in some ways, having anti IgM and IgG antibody um, assays is very useful when somebody's yeah. already been positive. Yeah, to, to work out what the degree of exposure was of the population. Mm. But people are looking at antigen tests, so trying to detect the virus mm. proteins mm. as mm. opposed to um, the virus RNA mm. as well. So, you know, we'll keep an eye on all that. That is ongoing at the moment. Yeah. Interesting, interesting times. They are interesting times. We're all yeah. um, going to be busy, I think, in this field for some time to come, you know, that hopefully the world's woken up to the fact that you can't neglect to fund hospitals, diagnostic labs, and fundamental research, you know, and as well to look after the planet because the emergence of these virus diseases in human populations you know, part of the drivers for that is sort of humankind encroaching on habitats um, mm. where these viruses kind of exist quite peacefully in their reservoir species. Mm. So, you know, it's, it is an indication that we're out of kilter um, mm. in terms of how we're treating our planet as well. And I'm not kind of an eco warrior by any means, but it's probably, you know, it's really woken me up as a virologist. Yeah. You know, I've seen goodness, mm. this is coming together, the whole climate agenda um, and just looking after the 
and the globalization. I mean, this globalization of people and of food also means globalization of viruses. So we get unwanted side um, side effects of, of some of our most innovative uh, means of, of um, solving our other problems, I suppose, our first world problems of, of wanting to have uh, foods at every out of season, let's say, and so on. That's right. And I, I suppose I've always said vir viruses are like, in terms of understanding cell biology, they're like torches that illuminate cell biology. But I feel this pandemic has really been like a spotlight that's illuminated mm -hmm. so much about, you know, what we're maybe not doing as well as we should be, where, mm -hmm. whether it's on the social side of things um, or just our exploitation of our resources. So I hope we've learned. I think we have learned, but I hope we will. So. And I hope we can. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So I think I'll just end the Q&A session there and I will probably, oh, there's another one. Just <laughs> 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 when you thought your Friday. Was hard. <laughs> Do you think since traces of the virus have been detected in patients two months after initial positive result that there is a need to test positive patients more regularly? I don't think so. Um, I don't see what information you gather from it. Look, it might be useful in um, trying to ascertain the, you know, the amount of uh, viral RNA that's present for, from um, a kind of a, a disease monitoring point of view. I, I, I don't see any benefit to it, really. You're just going to have more positives. Um, it's going to skew your, your percentage positive figures as well of testing. Um, I, I don't see any real benefit to it, I'm afraid, no. So that, that's the medical scientist speaking and which is yeah. a valid viewpoint. <laughs> As a research virologist, I, I would really like to see this. Um, I would like to know what's going on. You know, I, my background is looking at persistent virus infections, virus infections that don't get cleared completely or don't get cleared for a long time. And I would really like to see the data. I would like to know if that is going on um, in some SARS-CoV-2 infections, because that can be on an individual level. It wouldn't mean that everybody could be persistently infected, but I have a question. It's only a question. Can some people be, and that would need the research to determine um, if that is going on or not. Absolutely, and really, why would it not be going on? Because when you think, when we think about, we say the cold sore virus localizing to the trigeminal nerve and, and cropping up um, with with monotonous regularity to cause cold sores on your lip, for example. Yeah. You know, so it just it's wonder. now, but there are some coronaviruses that persist in the gut, so you just mm. don't know there. You just don't there know. Are questions to be answered, I think. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I will try again. I will try end the Q&A session um, again, and that will just bring an end to our talk. So I just want to thank you all again uh, for coming. It's been really informative, and I think the the take home message is just that um, there's a lot of cross sector collaboration necessary in order to make to make you know the problem go away as such. But it'll be a while before it goes away. But I think you know the work that's being done is just incredible. So thank you, thank you so much for that. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. So, um, yeah, I'll end the session. And so, okay. thanks. Thank you all for coming. Bye. Bye. Bye.